I'm Sam Slater from Chelsea and today I've been joined by Ketan Patel, manager of the Eden Tree Responsible and Sustainable UK Equity Fund. Thanks for joining us today Ketan. Thanks for having me on Sam. So perhaps we could start with the UK market generally. It's known for its dividend payouts, but a lot of that comes from the big oil and gas companies and um, ESG investors like yourself wouldn't be investing in those. So can ESG investors actually get income from the UK? And if so, could you tell us how? I think that's a very, very good observation and also a question as well. I mean, the, the UK market historically has always been particularly fertile when it comes to paying dividends. And it's got a very long track record. Now, over the last couple of years, that track record has been tested in uh, 2020 in particular, when we had a slew of deferrals, reductions, cancellations, and suspensions. And that hit the UK market very, very hard. There is a huge amount of concentration risk within the UK market, which has now become very, very evident. And this is more very relevant for ESG investors. If you think about the UK market, over 60% of dividends are paid out by just 15 companies. And the majority of those, as you say rightly, will not be suitable for ESG investors. So we're talking about oil and gas, mining, tobacco, defense, and alcohol beverages in particular. So where do ESG investors find uh, income? And dividends are really important. And perhaps people have forgotten in the last decade or so why dividends matter. 50% of your total return comes from dividends. If you reinvest that, it's 90%. So it's a huge part of what we call compounding and at the very heart of how we manage money at Eden Tree for the UK fund in particular. So where are we at 2022? We're a record payout, bizarrely, after two years of what has been a very difficult market for various geopolitical and macro reasons as well. There's going to be $1.56 trillion paid out in 2022, and that's going to be a record year. So how do ESG investors partake in the income story or the income landscape? Well, there's three or four key areas for us. The first one in terms of dividends is healthcare, which has always been particularly for come when it comes to paying out. So what dividend investors in particular like is yield, uh, growth and defensive as well. Healthcare gives you that because it's, it's not cyclical in particular. And when we talk about healthcare, we're talking about R&D giants, which we know really well, the likes of AstraZeneca and GlaxoSmithKline. Also, uh, medtech, the likes of Smith and Nephew. Then if you go further into diagnostics uh, and biotech and life sciences. And the UK has been a clear leader when it comes to life sciences in, uh, as, in, as in globally. And we can see that with the work that AstraZeneca did uh, over the last couple of years in particular. The second part of the market, which is very, very good for us, is financials. And by that, I just don't mean banks. Uh, we've got monetary headwinds, sorry, tailwind, should I say. The change in interest rates, uh, the environment's changing. I think we have the fastest rises in interest rates probably on record, which obviously benefits banks in particular, but also insurance companies and also financial services as well. A third area which we like is renewable energy. These are the funds which are into wind, solar, and other alternative uh, energy as well. So again, these are inflation-backed. So that's important given where CPI is 11% plus. And the fact that they're also defensive and they pay their dividends quarterly as well. Uh, so those are three really good core markets for UK investors. And if you have a global hat on, I would argue also information technology, which you wouldn't think would be the first place to call because tech companies are renowned for paying dividends. The fangs, i.e. the likes of Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix and Google, perhaps or not. But mature technology, uh, the likes of Cisco, Tim, SC, SAP, Sage, etc. are so you do have another part of the market. It's just a case you have to go deep dive a bit more. Uh, and by avoiding those very volatile parts of the market, which obviously have had a boost, uh, whether, whether it's an oil price spike or commodities, I think for dividend investors in particular, having companies that are growing the dividend steadily over a long period of time is what they want. And there's three key areas, healthcare, financials, and renewables are really, really good sources of income. And looking at the really big picture, obviously, at the back end of last year, we had the COP27 Summit of World Leaders. Were there any takeouts for investors from that? I think for us as, as a house, and, you know, we are leading ESG house and have been for well over 30 years, and it's COP27. Uh, and the number 27 probably gives it away, really. Uh, it's been disappointing. Uh, the loss and damage initiative, which is a step forward, we think, in recognising the polluted pace principle, which is good. But getting richer countries, which are heavy polluters, to partake in that is going to be difficult. 
but at least have had the initial conversation. That's a positive step. Um, but we're still on track for 2.4 degrees of warming. Uh, in Paris, you said is 1.5 was the aspiration. Um, every COP recently, uh, and, and COP goes back to the, to the late 80s, early 90s, there's always been a climate emergency emerging in the last few COPs. At what point does the emergency get tackled? Uh, and every every single year, uh, it will be another emergency. So we're struggling to see real concrete steps taken by not just governments, but also directions and initiatives for, for companies to partake. Uh, you know, it's going to be not just the allocation of capital by companies, but also public policy, which drives um, our way of lowering carbon footprints, improving the air quality, air pollution. And these things are real. Air pollution kills, you know, tens of thousands, if not millions every year. So this is real. Um, the emergency is now, but we need to tackle it. So COP27 has been disappointing. Uh, 26 was as well. Um, we just hope that the next one, what I don't want is by the time I'm retiring at COP50 or whatever the COP is, that we're still having this conversation. And, you know, or the pessimist, the pessimist in me says that we will, but the optimist, I hope will say, man, I really hope we get some progress over the next three or four years. Yeah, and I guess one of the, the problems that governments around the world, but here as well in the UK, have had, which sort of diverts their attention, is the cost of living crisis, which we're all experiencing at the moment. And yeah. bringing that back to the fund and the negative and the positive screens that you use, I noticed that sort of high interest lending companies are excluded and yeah. community is an aspect that you look for for positive action. So have either of those areas been amplified by cost of living or are there any other aspects that are coming to the fore when you talk to companies today? Yeah, I mean, obviously high interest lending and door set lending really just is a very difficult market because it exploits the most vulnerable. Uh, and that's not the kind of firm or the kind of clients that give us their capital. You know, the S in ESG is very much has a lower profile. The E is obviously extraordinarily sexy. We've seen it with, with the uh, articulation by the likes of Greta Thunberg, COP27, et cetera. G is very important because it's it's regulated, uh, whether it's uh, through financial services, et cetera. But the S rarely ever gets talked about, but only gets talked about when we get through very difficult pinch points like the cost of living crisis. And the S is very important <clears throat> because ultimately we are human capital. If we don't look after that, and when I mean human capital, I mean that in the broader sense, not just for companies, but also us as, as, as a society. If we cannot give people the best opportunities to grow and develop, then we are failing. Um, so we don't want to be part of that market, which is doorstep lending and high interest lending, because that's not an area which we want to work with. Where we are seeing some interest, and that's going to come through, I think, in the next year to maybe two years, is effectively people with mortgages, i.e. debt, um, credit card debt in particular, people who rent as well. So across everybody now from home buyers, sorry, from owners, home buyers, et cetera, owners, they are going to get a pinch because one of the things which is difficult also, I'd add utility companies here as well, and banks have a very key part to play in how they handle their customers and their clients to ensure that they are given the best opportunity to actually work with them and to ensure what we don't have is this cascade effect where loads of people lose their homes or become homeless or cannot pay their bills or cannot heat their homes, et cetera, or kind of feed their um, or their or their families so banks will be very important government policy in terms of helping so you know we would certainly look for the investments which we have in financial services and in banks and in utilities and see what are they doing rather than having a heavy-handed approach where they're willing to work with their customers and realize that this is going to be a tough one year maybe two year period and to give you just some context if you look at the housing market in the uk now everyone assumes everyone has a mortgage they don't only 30% of households in the UK actually have a mortgage, of which 80% are fixed. And that's a good thing because they're fixed at a very low rate because we've had a dozen years of very low interest rates. And people at times forget about basic mathematics. If you borrowed money at 1.5% and when your fix comes off, and to give you some context of how many people are coming off a fix, 70% of that 80% book is coming off every quarter. Now, even if you do basic math, seven times four is 28 by the time you hit 2014, 20, over half that book will have come off for refinancing, not at 1.5, but probably around six or even four or five. So your thousand pound mortgage bill will become 3,000 or 4,000. And I don't think anybody out there in terms of normal people would be able to afford that, that loss of disposable income. 
Uh, I mean, mortgage rates may lower, but I think banks in particular are going to have to find ways either through interest only or giving people breaks. Uh, somehow there'll be a lot of innovation required by banks to ensure that they do not let people um, you know, forfeit on their actual mortgage debt. And same with renters as well. You know, these people need help at the right time. Same with paying your bills. So we are very much looking at the behaviours of financial services and utilities, and even I'll probably include telcos as well. You know, everyone forgets that uh, 20, 30 years ago that your telephone was just a telephone. No, it's actually a lot more than that now. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of challenge in terms of the consumer going out, but not just in 23, but also in 24 as well. So a lot of unknowns out there. And Eden Tree carries out a lot of engagement with the companies they invest in and also companies they don't invest in. Yeah. Perhaps you could give us an example of um, some engagement you've had recently? Yeah, and I'll do one, I'll do a couple in the UK and one overseas just to give you the context. We are obviously invested globally as well. The first one, engagement is not all just about nice things, you know, having high fives and saying, well done, Sam, you've done a great job. No, sometimes having a very difficult conversation with companies who behave badly. A good example is Ericsson, uh, which were caught out with bribery and corruption allegations, which were proven that it'd be true. So the RI team, which internally, which is led by Neville uh, and four other colleagues, um, and they got in touch with Ericsson, uh, got hold of management the next day, as soon as the scandal broke out engaged with uh, the team and came away feeling that this was systemic. There is no way of Ericsson doing business in those parts of the world without them behaving inappropriately. Now that's our internal assessment, but that's what the clients pay us in terms of engagement, uh, voting, etc. And within a day, we had divested. So that is showing, and again, gain evidence of why. So, and Ericsson may come back in two, three years, and the biggest issue here was that we didn't feel they had enough resources in order to address the issues of bribery and corruption. So it would be another two or three, four years. And from a reputational risk and also financial risk as well, because, you know, those allegations, they'll have fines, et cetera. And there's a cost of putting things right. So from, it's a very much an investment case as well as a responsible and sustainable case as well. So that's one good example of when we disengage, uh, sorry, divested from it. The, I guess... At a thematic level, science-based targets versus net zero. And there's a big debate about net zero. Everyone's you know, falling in love with net zero, the idea that it will be net zero by 2050 or whatever, right, et cetera. But the predication on net zero is that you have to buy environmental credits, i.e. the offsetting. There's only so many credits in the world. It's a zero-sum game. And I always use the example of Tesla for many years, made more money from selling environmental credits to other uh, car companies who were heavy polluters. And that's how they made their, their profit. Now, Tesla does make some money from cars, finally. Um, but science-based targets are more important because they fundamentally ask a company to lower the total emissions from a start point over a period of time. So it's actually a goal and a target, and they have to tell you ways in which they're going to do this. So that's real. And ultimately, we need to lower the total amount of emissions that are going out into the atmosphere, not just net zero, because the planet is a close loop system. It's not like we can export our emissions. And maybe one day that, that may be a solution to the moon or to Mars or whatever. But until, you know, some superstar scientist um, sorts that out, I think we have to focus on science-based targets. So a good example is the companies in the portfolio, which have, you know, if they've got a, a strong science-based target, tick, we engage with those ones who have a soft a target and the ones who have no targets we engage with. Now, I the funding is a multi-cap, so you'd expect large cap companies to sign up, some of the mid-caps, but where we have a gap at times is in the mid-cap, sorry, in the small cap in particular. And that's where having a good engagement team led by Neville said, listen, we understand there's a cost, et cetera, but you know, how can we help and to tell you how this, how this is important, not only just from your ESG journey, but also from a financial perspective as well going forward because carbon has a cost to it. And the more you can manage your emissions, lower that, lower your carbon footprint, then there should be a feedback loop in terms of your, onto your PNL. So that engagement is, is it's ongoing with those companies who don't have science-based targets or have low targets. Uh, and that's been a real positive, not just in the UK funds, but also in our other funds as well. So all in all, that we've been fortunate that Neville's been calm for putting all our funds for nearly seven years. So the eighth iteration will kick off in 23. And having that track record over seven, eight years is really important. It shows that we just haven't 
latched on at the very last minute, you know, a Johnny come lately, so to say. And I'm pleased to say that the track record for the carbon footprint for the UK fund has been very low. I mean, it's, I think it's 60% lower than uh, it started in 2015, 2016, and it's 70% below the actual benchmark, which is the FTSE uh, all share. So that shows clients that we're not just uh, carbon aware, but actually this is a carbon light solution. And this is measured year on year as well. And, you know, there's a huge amount of data requirement now from all clients saying, it's pointless saying that you've signed up to X, but actually can you show us you've done that? And engaging with companies really, really does matter because they do listen. If you're, I would, I would say, if you engage in a positive mind frame saying, we want you to do the right thing, but we're here to, to be patient and work with you. And um, maybe just finally, you could tell us which part of, um, sort of the ESG is exciting you most or concerning you most personally at the moment? I'll start with concern and then end on a positive. Um, I, th I think the amount of greenwashing um, is actually quite disturbing. And there's a huge backlash now taking place um, at an individual level, at a company level, at a regulatory level as well. There's enough press articles out there to tell you there's some very big fund managers who got into trouble uh, by labeling their products green, not getting to article eight or even nine. And I want to say mis-selling because that's probably too or too strong, but I'm saying mislabeling. And that effectively damages not only them, but also damages the ESG sector in its broader sense. And we've been specialists for well over 30 years. Our first uh, fund was launched in 1988, which is the fund that I, I lead on. So we have a real history of being particularly focused, disciplined on ESG. The amount of people in the last, I'd say, year, year and a half, 18 months have now got onto the bandwagon are not suitable because what they have is two or three funds or products, and they're just trying to make a quick bit of buck. And we're not. We're here for the very, very long run. So greenwashing is a real issue and regulation as well with the EU coming in, asking people to sign up correctly. Now, regulation generally can be good, but it can also catch a lot of you know, unintended consequences as well. So for us as a house, we have to be careful. And we're doing a lot of work to make sure that the funds we sell are labeled correctly, whether they're Article 9 or not, and also sold into the right channels and also to the right clients as well. There's a lot of people signing up to yes, I mean, one of the things I had a friend of mine He's recently doing some postgrad work at Cambridge and he's looking at pension funds. And when you have a pension fund choice, you know, there is a label, it's ESG or it's green. But then when he when you look at the top 10, it's called BP and Shell. Um, well, that's not what the client's vision or idea of ESG is. So I think there's a lot of work that has to be done on transparency on that. So there is a concern on that because uh, it could impact the whole sector. On the exciting parts, I guess, from my perspective, as, we're, as a bottom-up stock picking fund manager, I think the most exciting journeys have been through those companies and those company management who really embraced E, S, and G. Uh, the G is very easy because they have to comply to that the, by law, but the S in particular uh, has been exciting because of what's happened in the last two, three years, in particular, you know, more with the more recent the cost of living. But, you know, we've had a very challenging uh, macro and geopolitical situation over the last two, three years. In fact, you know, some of the events are one in a hundred year events. And it's been pleasing to see how companies have embraced the change when it comes to being employee-led, employee-centric, and also ensuring that, that their products and services are aligned with what I would call doing good, not only for the bottom line, but also for the environment and also for the social as well. So that's been really interesting that how companies and management, and there's a new generation of management that have come through. And I'll give you a really good example at a sector level, pharma which for years and years was called big bad pharma, you know, and in, and in many cases it, it did behave badly. But in the last couple of years in particular, we've had pharma really get an opportunity to embrace and really be, you know, seen as not the good guys, but one of the good guys. So really good examples here would be the change in management at all the big large pharma companies recently, a slew of very young, intelligent um. ESG, and I'd say s oriented management and coming, whether that's at Novartis uh, in particular, uh, Glaxo, I would argue, and also Sanofi, and some of the US names as well. So that's been really, really pleasing that there is a new generation of management coming think and recognizing actually that, you know, they cannot behave in the same model as it did in the 90s or the zeros. The world has changed and they need to deliver more than just profits. They need to do, you know, you know as we say at Even Street, uh, you know, profits with principles. And that's a really pleasing part of the market. 
for me personally. As always, Kenton, that was very interesting. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Sam. And if you'd like to find out more about the Eden Tree Responsible and Sustainable UK Equity Fund, please go to chelseafs.co.uk.